Okay, we're, we're going to get started. I hope you all are well. Good morning. We're very pleased to welcome you. I'm Anthony Crowell, the Dean and President here at New York Law School. And it is a great honor that you've joined us today and a great honor that City Planning Commission Chair and the Director of the Department of City Planning, Dan Garodnik, is joining us this morning for a terrific presentation. I'm so glad that my friend and colleague, Professor Ross Sandler, who directs the Center for New York City Law, thought it was the right time to invite Dan, and I couldn't agree more. I have the great pleasure of serving with Dan as a member of the City Planning Commission, and I certainly think that uh, now is an extraordinary time for uh, the public to become even more educated on the work of the commission and the direction of the city. Dan and I have known each other for a very long time. Um, in some ways, we grew up in city government together, and uh, it's nice to have this opportunity to work with him uh, at the commission. And I can say that uh, at this moment in our city's history, there are few opportunities where one can have as meaningful an opportunity to make a difference than in the area of shaping the city's future. Uh, I will say, I have a lot of discussions with individuals around uh, New York about the future of the city. And I must say that for me, no conversation of that nature uh, fails to mention the work that Dan is doing and leading the department, leading the commission, and also uh, his great leadership uh, in so many ways in the civic space in New York. That's why it's a very uh, big honor for us to have him here. The Department of City Planning and the work of the City Planning Commission is extraordinary. It is helping to shape our city's future, making it more affordable, making it more prosperous, more equitable, and more sustainable. All those things are vital right now as we confront so many different forces that make New York both enormously challenging, but also allowing us to shape the great promise for the urban sphere. The city of Yes Plan that Dan will discuss today covers all the areas I just broadly outlined, and the commission is working diligently to ensure that it hears all perspectives from New York's communities and really works to determine the right path forward for our city. We have many faculty, students, and alumni working in and around New York City land use and real estate, and certainly the Centers for New York City Law and the Center for Real Estate Studies here at the law school are important vehicles for not only convening, but doing important work that create opportunities for our community members to work at the intersection of land use and real estate. And I just wanna mention uh, Commissioner David Gold from the City Planning Commission is here with us today. Um, and as I talk about our alumni, his parents are alumni of the school. His dad sadly has passed, but his parents uh, were graduates of the classes of 1965 and 66. So uh, it's particularly nice to welcome you here uh, as a child of, of alums, although you went to Cardozo, I'm sorry to say that. But um, <laughs> he's making much better choices now. I can tell you on that, he really is. Uh, and I also just want to acknowledge Ryan Myler, who is uh, one of our students who is in our Gotham Honors Program and is working at the Department of City Planning uh, in that capacity in a full semester externship. So welcome. I'm going to turn this over to Ross to officially introduce Dan and start our program, but I just want to make sure you all know we're thrilled that you're here and you are always welcome at New York Law School. Ross. Um, well, everybody, I'm glad that we're all here. I wanted to say the photograph uh, that you see when you walked in, uh, I, I saw in the book, and uh, uh, his book about Stuyvesant Town. And so I uh, went and Google and I could find it. And there it is. What year was that? 2005. 2005. How old were you? I was 33. 33. Okay. And then 12 years on the city council. Terrific career. A wonderful career that uh, in many ways uh, uh, is uh, 
focuses on Stuyvesant Town and Peter Gooper, for which you uh, are famous, famously uh, known and for which you should be because of the great work you did there. And I thought uh, in some ways in introducing you, uh, since everybody probably knows a lot about you, maybe more than I do, and I thought I would uh, introduce you by showing some photographs of things that really mean a lot to you. And so the next is the construction of Stuyvesant Town. This is 1947. This is when they cleared the area and you can see uh, how big it is. And then the next photo is built, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper built. This is when affordable housing was really being built in the city. The next photograph is current as it looks today really quite beautiful and an enormous asset of the city. And then this last picture I like because it shows the super talls in the background. And uh, that of course is the issue uh, that faces us. Uh, how do you match a Stuyvesant town, affordable housing and the super talls? In his book, Stuyvesant Town, uh, Dan wrote that his formative years were spent in a two room apartment in Peter Cooper my mother had moved into the community in the late 1960s, and once she'd got married to my dad, they never seriously considered leaving because it afforded them a reasonable and stabilized rent, beautiful grounds, and more space than they could afford otherwise in Manhattan. And so uh, this, is, uh, um, this is the heritage, the background, and what uh, Dan brings to his current position as chair and director of the city planning. We are really delighted to have you here and we look forward to what you're going to do more for New York City. Thank you for being here. And also there is one person in this room who was actually present uh, those days, my friend Ellen Gustafson, who is here, uh, was in high school at the time. I met her standing on a street corner during the campaign, uh, and she has gone on. She went on to work in my council office and then has gone on to have a great, great career after. So, Ellen, thank you for all of that. So um, let me uh, let me talk about the subject at hand today. It looks like the presentation is up and it looks like I may even have control over it. Um, the city of yes proposals that uh, the mayor started talking about last year are now very much coming to life. Uh, and they're really important efforts for us to try to make real changes to our city zoning resolution uh, in a variety of different ways. And I, I have noted uh, the subject of housing has gotten a lot of attention recently uh, and for good reason. And we're gonna talk about that. But we have three proposals out there. Each one of them is a citywide proposal and each one of them is designed to take on big challenges in a very, very serious way. These, each one of these are, are uh, significant, but together they are the largest updates to New York City zoning since 1961, uh, which will help us through a, each of them create a greener, more prosperous and affordable city. The first proposal, is related to carbon neutrality to help us promote uh, our environmental goals in New York City. The second, to help turbocharge our local economy and to try, to, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit too, uh, try to deal with vacant storefronts and limitations that have become arbitrary over time that are impeding uh, growth uh, in uh, our uh, local uh, job opportunities. And then last for housing opportunity. And you can see here uh, the, the trajectory of each of these proposals. Carbon neutrality is well on its way. I just testified before the city council on this one this week. It is on their plate to decide yay or nay or to modify. Uh, economic opportunity is the second. We'll be sending that on to community boards um, officially uh, within the coming week. So community board members, Get ready, this one's coming your way. Thank you, by the way, for weighing in on uh, carbon neutrality, the first one. Uh, and uh, we expect that'll be voted on uh, by the city council uh, in the spring. And the third for housing opportunity is um, at the very beginning of the process, we are starting our environmental review of that one. So you see a longer time horizon in yellow that will be sent off to uh, community boards and borough presidents next spring. And we expect a vote on that one in the fall of 2024. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn, 
and then I'll be happy to take your your questions about uh, any of them in whatever format uh, Professor Sandler uh, uh, tells me to take. Um, first of these proposals is our City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality uh, proposal. Um, and a lot of people think about zoning and they say, well, it's about just how big a building you can put somewhere or whether it's a manufacturing zone or whether it's a residential zone or a commercial zone. But in reality, zoning does a lot more than what people frequently think. So when you consider questions of how much solar you can put on the roof of a building, zoning defines those questions or how thick an insulated wall can be or which parking lots can install electric vehicle chargers or where you can install electric vehicle chargers. These are all things that zoning dictates. So we have a number of goals in this proposal uh, and I wanna talk about each of them in turn. The first one is for us to decarbonize our energy grid. As you all know, we have very, very strict rules and goals on how to uh, move our energy grid to a more renewably based system. Uh, by 2040, we have to get there. Uh, and I will note, we are a long way away. Um, as we have, uh, we're about a, a third of the way to where we need to be on solar. Uh, and when you think about the grid of the future, it's not relying on just a single one-way direction of dirty energy producing uh, power plant sends energy out to our homes and businesses around the city. It is more of a energy is distributed, distributed, generated across a wide variety of areas. That energy is stored and shared, in some cases sent back onto the power grid, in some cases you, you take from the power grid. It's a much more distributed way of doing energy generation. That is the future. We need to be able to enable that. Decarbonizing our building stock. Um, I will note in New York City, in contrast to some other cities around uh, the country, uh, our buildings are our biggest polluters. So 70% of our carbon emissions come from our buildings in New York City. And notably, 90% of the buildings that are presently built will still be around in 2050. So that means that for us to be able to decarbonize our buildings, we need to retrofit them and we need to be able to give them tools to be able to be retrofit. Uh, and so decarbonizing our building stock is another important goal here. Decarbonizing vehicles, less than 1% of our 2 million cars in New York City today are um, zero emission vehicles. Uh, and as people think about moving to EV, one of the biggest challenges that they face is finding a place to charge. Uh, and unfortunately, zoning is an obstacle here in limiting where you actually can do EV charging. And lastly, uh, a goal here is for us to decarbonize our waste streams. Um, of note, there is no mention of composting and or recycling in our zoning resolution. It just doesn't exist. Uh, and as a result, it has gotten very confusing for people, businesses, others who are trying to find ways to advance these important goals. If zoning is ambiguous, people freeze because they don't want to do things that are potentially illegal and might subject themselves to fines. We need to clarify in zoning that this is a good thing, something we want to see happening, uh, and, uh, and to take steps to do that. So the proposal for carbon neutrality is, is a lot of detail here, and I'm not gonna dwell on all of these 17 uh, proposals, but I'm just gonna give you a couple of highlights because I think that they're interesting. Uh, first, as it relates to rooftop solar today, we have very strict limitations on how much of your roof you can cover with solar. We want to eliminate those limitations, be able to cover an entire rooftop. Uh, we wanna be able to enable solar, uh, parking canopies on parking lots around New York City. We've got lots and lots and lots of open parking lots uh, and zoning rules that impede, they impede the ability to add standalone solar above those parking lots. Uh, as it relates to buildings, where zoning gets in the way here is if you're looking to retrofit a building, add a high performance wall, a facade, uh, and that bumps you out of your zoning envelope, you're out of luck. You can't do it. We want you to do it, but we're prohibiting you from doing it because that extra small handful of inches 
adds FAR to your building, which is not allowed, we want to be able to allow that uh, here. Um, electric vehicle charging, we want to allow for that in all commercial districts around New York City. That is not allowed uh, today. More flexibility on where there can be electric vehicle charging. Uh, and lastly, on waste and water, water we want to uh, create more flexibility on permeable paving and on bioswales and rain gardens uh, to be able to enable those sorts of newer opportunities that did not exist when the zoning resolution uh, was created uh, and uh, also to um, uh, allow new use regulations so that composting and recycling, it's clear where and when they are allowed. Okay, so that's the first proposal and I did it quickly, so you'll forgive me, but I, I wanted to be sensitive to your time and also the level of complexity of these proposals. They are, uh, you know, they're, they're rich in detail. Uh, if you wanna see the text of any of the proposals, uh, they well, at least the, the, the first one, because that one is out there in the world already, um, I encourage you to do it. And if you don't want to see the details, then we have handy summaries uh, like what I've got for you uh, today. Um, the second proposal relates to economic opportunity. So I want to talk about that next. Remember, this is the one that will go off to community boards and borough presidents in the near term and will be at the council in the spring. Uh, zoning affects not only things like solar panels and uh, you know and what districts or how big a building can be, but it also affects the sorts of questions like where you can open a business or what you can do in that space where you might have the opportunity to expand or not. Uh, and there are real challenges and there are real limitations that we've baked into zoning over time, which frankly no longer make sense. They are outdated constructs. We need to create more flexibility. Um, you know, one example you know, that I think of is, you know, a bakery in a residential area that uh, has done really well as a result of people working from home a little bit more. It's a community bakery. They're having success. We're seeing a lot of success on local um, commercial corridors as a result of all of this. And that's a good thing. Uh, but the bakery is, you know, doing well and wants to expand to a vacant office or vacant retail frontage uh, next door. Um, but once you go past that 800 square foot marker, that bakery becomes officially a food manufacturer and would have to relocate it into, relocate into a manufacturing zone. Now, obviously there is a, an appropriate limit on where you trigger that distinction between a, a humble bakery and a, man, a food manufacturer but we believe it's not at 800 uh, square feet. We're looking to create more flexibility for expansion, uh, allow for um, you know, more chances for life sciences in New York City, uh, and also, of course, an age-old favorite, uh, dancing, which is still blocked by zoning, interestingly enough. Um, okay, the goals here. Uh, we wanna make it easier for businesses to find space uh, in New York City and to grow. We wanna lift the barriers that exist in zoning to allow businesses to be closer to their customers, support growing industries, reduce some of the impediments that we have put in place over time for emerging business types. Um, we wanna create vibrant neighborhoods by making sure that we have safe and walkable corridors that are good for business and good for everyone. And we wanna create new opportunities for local businesses to open. Uh, new zoning tools to boost job growth and business expansion. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, I'm going to talk about just a, a few highlights here because I, I don't think it's a, we have the time to go in depth to each of the 17 or 18 of these, much like the one on carbon neutrality. Uh, but uh, I will note that in zoning, we, we do some strange things here, like, um, you know, in a, you see this example number two, you have a C1 and a C2 district. So C1 is a commercial designation and it defines specific types of uses that you can do in a local small scale commercial area. Um, and uh, between C1 and C2, you might find uh, and do find that you can do a bike rental uh, and repair on one side of the street in a C1 and a bike sales on the other side of the street in the C2, but you can't do both on both sides of the street. Now, it is an example of the sorts of antiquated use group limitations, which have the effect of stifling opportunity 
in a nonsensical way. We want to take a close look here and we are going to propose what we believe are reasonable updates to our use group regulations. Uh, we also wanna allow for small scale, clean manufacturing businesses in commercial areas. So if you think about a uh, pottery studio, jewelry maker, uh, sort of light manufacturing, the sorts of things that do not have environmental impacts, we want to be able to enable that to have more opportunities around the city. Uh, and we intend to do that in this proposal. Uh, loading docks, we have found that <clears throat> through our loading dock requirements in New York City, sometimes in manufacturing areas, uh, in some commercial areas, you might find an appropriate building to locate. Uh, and if you want to locate in that building, you may be required to add a loading dock. You may have no reason to add a loading dock and the owner of the building may have no interest in creating a loading dock for you. That limitation uh, is one which is impeding progress and something that we want to do away with. Other examples here, life sciences, we talked about a little bit. Uh, we want regulated licensed labs to be able to expand closer to hospitals and universities. Nightlife, I mentioned uh, dancing. So you can have live music in some places, still no dancing. So I just wanna note that is your zoning resolution is the one that defines where you can stand up and actually dance. Uh, we're not touching venue sizes. We're not touching where and when those things can take place. Those are all defined in other ways. But our view is if you can have live music, you should be able to dance. Uh, and so we are uh, proposing to once and for all eliminate uh, the last vestiges of dancing limitations and zoning. Um, simplify and moderate. Hey, thank you, Professor. Love it. Um, uh, and we want to modernize and define how amusements, arcades, virtual, virtual reality, things that did not exist when these rules were written. Um, you know, we still have type regulations for typewriter repair in the zoning resolution, but we don't have anything for arcades or virtual reality. No surprise, these rules have not been updated in a very long time. And as a result, things get stopped. Um, and then, of course, expand type of businesses that, that New Yorkers can have in their homes, something that we have heard a lot about as we come out of the pandemic. Fostering vibrant neighborhoods, we want to create consistent and easy to understand rules for ground floor designs. We don't have full blank walls in areas which we want to be vibrant streetscapes, uh, reduce some of the conflicts with, with pedestrians on sidewalks, and also on micro distribution. We, uh, we, know that New Yorkers are living and shopping differently than they did in 1961. Um, we want to facilitate safe and sustainable delivery hubs that are respectful of neighborhoods, but also recognize the reality of the fact that there is a lot of online activity and there's a lot of truck traffic that we want to try to address. The last goal here is um, creating new opportunities for local businesses to open. Uh, we wanna create a process by way of example here for corner stores in areas where there really is no access to a corner store, uh, create a process for you to add a small corner store in a, an area where there otherwise is no business activity. Um, we wanna allow for more flexibility uh, in areas like film studios, which to when they comply with existing zoning, they just can't build the type of buildings that you would need to be able to build to do a film studio in New York. It's an industry which is important to us in New York City. It's something we want to see grow. Zoning is in the way, it's creating obstacles and hurdles. So we want a better waiver process. So if you wanna go outside the rules, we wanna make it a little easier for you to be able to ask us to go outside the rules for our film studios and a couple of other types. Uh, loft style zoning districts, um, you know, we have heard from the uh, proprietors of buildings in manufacturing zones that the zoning rules today are not keeping up with their needs. They want more flexibility for job intensive buildings in manufacturing districts. So we are proposing new zoning designations to allow growth in M districts in New York City. Uh, okay, so this is the, the 18. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go through them here, but you can get a sense of what all of the individual proposals are. Uh, and again, this one is uh, coming uh, to community boards and borough presidents uh, in the very, very near term. Okay, and then the third proposal 
uh, uh, is for housing opportunity. And again, this is the one which is uh, at the closest to the start, as opposed to the other two, um, because this is the one that actually required a full environmental review when you start changing rules on housing and parking and things like that. Uh, you uh, are making changes that have to be studied as a matter of environmental impact. We are commencing that process right now. In fact, we sent out our official scoping documents on September 26th. Uh, this process is underway. Um, as the mayor noted just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the future of housing is the future of New York City. We are proposing the most ambitious changes uh, in history as it relates to housing supply. Uh, and the goal here is for us to create a little more housing in every neighborhood around the city. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? Uh, to me, a little more housing in every neighborhood means that we're going to, in the aggregate, be able to create a lot of housing, but we're going to be able to do it without the dramatic changes that neighborhoods frequently fear. Um, I think that's a really important point because we want to be respectful of neighborhoods in this process. A lot of work has gone into neighborhoods over time, uh, but we also want to recognize the fact that in New York City, we have 59 community boards. Nine of them last year produced as much housing as the other 50 together. Uh, so we need to spread this out. We need to do a little more everywhere in a way that is respectful to our communities. What will it do? Uh, it will address root causes of our high housing costs, which is, of course, lack of opportunity, lack of supply, support job growth, fiscal health of New York City. We want to be able to have housing so that when businesses are attempting to locate here, they actually have a workforce that can live anywhere in the vicinity and can afford to do so. And of course, supporting our environmental goals by building more housing in built up areas with great access to jobs and transit. You know, just one quick note here about the human costs of what we are presently experiencing in New York. You know, over the last decade, we created about 800,000 jobs and about 200,000 homes. Uh, the pressures are great. We have certain areas of the city that have essentially stopped producing any housing at all. And what, what happens in that context, that means high rents for everybody. It means gentrification pressures, really acute in some neighborhoods. Um, it means a real imbalance of power between landlords and tenants in New York City. If you're a tenant uh, and you are faced with an exorbitant rent, if you're not a protected, uh, you know, rent stabilized, rent controlled, don't have other protections, if you are faced with an exorbitant rent increase and you have no other options, you, you have to eat it or you have to move even further away. Um, and these are the sorts of challenges that tenants have. Of course, it presents itself in other ways too, a lack of repairs or in the worst extreme uh, cases, uh, you know, harassment, the imbalance of power between landlords and tenants. It is an unhealthy dynamic. We need to add more leverage on the other side. Adding more supply is one way for us to do that. Um, okay, so let's talk about the moves that we are making in this proposal. So on the screen here, you can see uh, a well-recognized um, map of New York City. In the blue, you have our lower density areas, which in zoning we refer to as our R1 to R5 districts, and then medium and high density uh, areas, which are represented here in orange, and that is R6 to uh, R10. Uh, we have proposals for all of these areas, um, and I'm going to talk about all of those proposals, but they are really focused on respectfully adding a little bit more everywhere. And then of course, we also have an important proposal on parking and other citywide actions uh, to enable conversions, smaller apartments, and also infill on big campuses. Okay, so I wanna talk about the, the low density zoning, low density areas first, and then I'm gonna go to the high density areas. So one of our first proposals for low density areas, and you can see where uh, we're focusing here because they're sprinkled on the map. Uh, we want to be able to allow for modest, mixed-use, um, middle, missing middle housing in commercial districts. So what do I mean by missing middle? So if you look at the image on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, that four-story apartment building, which is a very well-recognized form of housing in New York City, even in particularly in low-density areas, uh, you could not replicate on the 
above the grocery uh, laundromat and coffee store on the left-hand side of the screen. Why? Well, the building on the right was built before 1961. And what has happened since is that we have added on uh, not only rear yard requirements, parking requirements, limitation on density. So you couldn't actually even create that well-recognized four-story apartment building atop the retail corridor right next door. Uh, we want to enable that. Missing middle, to me, that's a three to five story apartment building. It's something that is modest, well-recognized all around the city in low density areas. I will note we have about 16,000 um, you know, buildings like this that are already in districts that are one and two family districts. Uh, and so people recognize them, they like them, they embrace them. And we think that we should no longer have the limitation above the laundromat here. Where do we have commercial districts uh, in low density areas? That's where you can see sprinkled on the map here in red. So they are just a little bit everywhere. Transit oriented development. Now this is a term that gets a lot of play. What do we actually mean about this here is we wanna allow that missing middle type of housing in low density areas where you are close to transit. Not every site next to transit will be eligible for this but we have thoughtfully crafted this proposal to define exactly what qualifying sites can actually take advantage of this program to create this uh, four-story apartment building. If you're close to transit, you're on a wide street, you're on the short end of a block, you have a certain amount of square footage, 5,000 square feet or more, you will be able to take advantage of this program. And again, they are on the margins of low density areas and are already present everywhere. We wanna be able to legally enable them so that they can move forward so we can create a little bit more housing, multifamily housing uh, on the margins here, particularly near transit. You can see in the purple on the map where those areas are. I will just, I will make mention again, just to remind everybody, you don't see a whole lot of action uh, in Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City, um, in, in, in this or, or in the South Bronx. Why? Because we're only talking about the low density areas right now. We're going to talk about high density areas in, in a minute. So I just want to make sure you see why we make that distinction. Okay. We also want to help homeowners in low density areas. Um, we want homeowners to have some flexibility to add a backyard cottage, a basement or garage apartment, an attic conversion. This is happening all around the country. This is not a novel proposal. What is novel is the fact that New York State, New York City have heretofore been resistant to it because it is a good thing for homeowners. It's been a good thing for multi-generational families, middle-class homeowners to be able to provide space to an aging relative legally, to be able to rent out a space to help pay for your mortgage or help pay for future college costs, or even to generate a little wealth for yourself. It is okay. We want to enable middle-class homeowners to have this opportunity. They don't have this legal opportunity today. We think they should. We also want to uh, allow for um, more flexibility in our low-density districts. So many buildings today are out of compliance because they were built before 1961. Uh, and as a result, homeowners are headed, running headstrong into other city regulations, trying to get insurance, trying to do small changes to their property. Uh, they run into challenges with the Department of Buildings because their buildings are out of zoning compliance. We want to bring them into compliance, give them more help with financing, renovations, insurance, et cetera. And also, we want to have enough flexibility in our low density districts that you actually can build a two family home in a two family district and a multifamily building in a multifamily district, something which today our zoning is not allowing to happen. So we give the opportunity, but through lots of extra rules, rear yard, side yard, parking, et cetera, we are taking away that opportunity. We don't want to take that opportunity away anymore. Okay, high density areas. Now we're focusing on the orange, uh, the light orange and the dark orange. They're slightly different in the way that we treat a specific program that I wanna to talk to you about. Uh, and also slightly different in the way that we are proposing changes here. So New York City today has a program where we give a density bonus to building owners that want to deliver to us or are willing to deliver to us senior affordable housing permanently. 
So if you're willing to deliver permanent, affordable housing for senior citizens, we will give you roughly a 20% density bonus. Great, we like it. Good program, it exists, it exists today in the light orange areas of New York City. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna make that program available for all types of affordable housing and supportive housing, okay? Simple. If you get the bonus for senior affordable, we want you to be able to get the bonus for all types of affordable. We wanna expand the opportunities here, create the incentive for us to allow more affordable housing in high density areas by expanding an existing program to cover all types of affordable housing. That's one. Number two, there are certain areas of the city where you do not get that bonus for senior affordable housing. And those are the areas in the dark orange. So you can see them on the map. We wanna provide this opportunity there too, okay? There's no reason why uh, those areas should not also have the same density bonus for affordable housing. We think that should be afforded there. So in all of the orange, you can look at this as one whole sum. We are proposing in all of these areas uh, for that incentive. You can choose to do it, you can choose not to do it, but there will be an opportunity that is consistent with the city's policy goals to get affordable housing. Next, <clears throat> we wanna lift parking mandates. So New York City today uh, has a zoning resolution which defines in every district, in every neighborhood, in every building, the precise minimum percentage of parking that must be provided. It's 25% here, it's 150% there, it's 50% elsewhere, it's 100% in another neighborhood. It is defined with a level of precision that it no longer deserves because nobody really knows the answer to what the precise minimum amount of parking that you need in every single development. And in fact, <clears throat> parking has run directly in conflict with the creation of housing in New York City, which is why it is part of this proposal. We see in many circumstances, people are coming to the city planning commission, the department of city planning for the waiver on parking because either it's cost or because it is just not necessary because they're in a transit rich area. Uh, we know that in certain districts, you get 10 units of housing before you hit mandatory parking requirements, but then you, you want to put in that 11th unit of housing, all of a sudden you have a 50% parking requirement, six parking spaces. So to get to unit 11, you got to add six parking spaces. So the decision there is frequently, no, not doing that, just not doing that. At a cost of $67,500 on average, that's a citywide average to build a parking space that becomes an insurmountable challenge for a small property owner and something which frequently they don't want. And I will note that average cost, that includes you know, the $5,000 blacktop in a single family home in Staten Island. And it includes the $200,000 single parking spot when you have to dig underneath in downtown Brooklyn. And that's where you get that average. So it has a wide range of costs and has a wide impact. Our view is, the minimum requirement is not something that we should define in zoning. The, the market it will tell us precisely where you need to have what level of parking. We're not dictating the max. And we're going to need parking in lots of areas of New York City. We have lots of areas of New York City that are not accessible by transit in a very meaningful way. Parking is not only uh, important, it is critical in those areas. And we are not doing anything about the opportunity to create parking. What we are not doing is defining it so precisely within the zoning resolution. Okay, the last things that I wanna talk, uh, talk about and then uh, I will close um, are uh, enabling the conversion of underutilized office buildings is another area which has gotten a lot of attention recently. Uh, we have a 19% vacancy rate in our commercial office space in New York City. Uh, and we obviously have a, a keen need for more housing. So expanding the opportunity uh, for more buildings to convert uh, is something that we want to do. Just to illustrate, you know, and this is you know, not a precise way of describing this, but for most opportunities, if you weren't built before 1961 and you're not in Midtown Manhattan, this opportunity really is not available to you. There are exceptions. Lower Manhattan is an exception. There are some small geographic exceptions. We want to change the date of eligibility from 1961 
1990. We want to expand the eligibility citywide. We also want to allow different types of apartment models, small shared apartments. Some of this we can do through zoning and want to. And also there are campuses around uh, the, the city uh, which have development rights, church campuses, other areas that want to be able to build on a parking lot, for example, but our rules today strictly prohibit, forbid it, prohibit it, uh, even when you have the development rights to do it, we want to change that. Okay, so overall, and this is the this is the summary here, and then there's just a couple of other quick things that I want to mention, although I see we're running uh, short on time, uh, are, you know, the goals here, create more affordable housing, create a little bit more of housing in all neighborhoods, reduce significantly that pressure that gentrifying neighborhoods are feeling today, and some of the areas that are hit hardest by the housing shortage and our exclusionary zoning practices, really take aim at what has become a real limit over time, but while allowing respectful growth citywide uh, and allow for more flexibility for homeowners and more sustainable transit oriented development and more uh, housing in America's least carbon intensive city. So that is our housing proposal. Now, before I close, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. You know, we are taking a big bite three big bites out of the zoning resolution on carbon neutrality, economic opportunity, and housing. Uh, but that is not the entire workload of the Department of City Planning. In fact, we also continue to do the work on our neighborhood plans at the same time. Uh, already, we, uh, we have activated uh, programs for South Richmond zoning relief on Staten Island. We are uh, in the process of doing neighborhood plans related to the Bronx Metro North stations, which are coming in the East Bronx, particularly in Morris Park station there, Park Chester Van Ness, there's a station there, real opportunities for housing, uh, to be able to expand commercial opportunities. Morris Park, uh, you know, has 23,000 jobs within a half mile of that station. Uh, there's a, you've got lots of important institutions interested in expansion, interested in partnership with uh, with private sector, we want to do more there, and that's part of that entire plan. Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn, um, is a, a, a neighborhood that uh, is in need of a fresh look, infrastructure investments, housing opportunity, job creation. We are working uh, on a plan there. And Jamaica, uh, Queens, another incredible, vibrant neighborhood of New York City. Uh, we've just begun our public engagement uh, on that proposal. Um, I will note Jamaica Station, and this is a fact that you may all know, but it actually eluded me. I thought it was really interesting. It's the fourth busiest rail station in America, in America. I mean, it just that stat is just, it really is staggering. And so when you think about the opportunities for transit-oriented development, like Jamaica, Queens is prime time. It is a great, great uh, community. It needs economic uh, activity. It needs affordable housing. Uh, it needs infrastructure investment. And we are working with the Speaker of the City Council, Adrian Adams, and local council member Natasha Williams and the Borough President of Queens, uh, Donovan Richards, uh, to get that right. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that we have um, started uh, our process and we're having our first virtual public workshop on the 17th uh, related to our Midtown South mixed use plan. So, uh, Community Board Five, we're ready for you. Uh, and um, uh, this is a, we have four areas uh, in 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 Midtown, and I say four areas. They're in my mind, they're roughly rectangles, but they are odd odd shapes. Just zone for manufacturing, right in Midtown. Uh, and so, if you wanted to create housing there, you can't. If you wanted to do an office conversion to residential there, you can't. Um, and so we are studying this question, thinking about the future of Midtown South. Uh, and we love our partners at Community Board 5, and we look forward to working with them. Uh, we were asked to do this by the borough president, Mark Levine, the two local council members, uh, uh, Keith Powers uh, and Eric Botcher. We're excited uh, to get that underway. And then the last thing is we also deal with a lot of private applications. So individual applicants looking to make changes to the zoning regulations on their own property. Uh, we are trying to find ways that the Department of City Planning is important to the mayor uh, for us to reduce the impediments that we frequently create for applicants. We want to speed up uh, our pre-certification process. 
improve our public participation in the land use process, find more opportunities uh, to engage on these individual applications, and also to, to, to work across city agencies to improve the environmental review process, which frequently uh, bogs people down when they're thinking to make important change and changes that we want to allow them to make. So with that, I will stop, Professor, and I will again thank you for the opportunity to share some of these initiatives with you, and I look forward to answering your questions. So thank you very much. Yes, we should have some questions. I was thinking that I was listening to all this. I woke up this morning and looked at my to-do list, and I was overwhelmed. Then I heard your to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say um, you got a lot on your list. Uh, Questions. Let's start over here, and um, we only have a few minutes, but so short is best, and short answers okay, too. Done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle D. Winfield. Thank you for your well-developed plan, Honorable Grotnick. But New York is one of the most segregated states in America. How does your plan help with that problem? Thank you, Shelley. I appreciate that, that uh, question. Uh, one of the things that we are really hopeful about this plan is that it furthers our fair housing goals to enable um, affordable housing, different types of housing in neighborhoods where it has historically been shut out. Um, we have lots of neighborhoods in New York City that have not functionally produced any housing in a long time. Uh, and uh, we, we, that, we know that's a mistake. Uh, and that also corresponds to racial limitations and historic acts of discrimination uh, that have been present and really defined our zoning resolution over time. Um, so by enabling more affordable housing in high density areas, by enabling more modest multifamily and low density areas, we think that we are having the effect of uh, integrating New York City in a meaningful way, adding housing to New York City in a meaningful and responsible way. So we hope that will be the end result. Danny G, we Sorry. need more Section A supportive housing in all five boroughs. We have many vacant buildings, vacant lots. Many people have mentioned it over the years. And I think they said it is still vacant making the last two decades, if not more. Yep, yep, thank you. So on, on the subject of vacant, vacant lots or vacant buildings, <clears throat> there are certain things that we have the ability to do within zoning and there are certain things that are outside of zoning. Within zoning, vacant lots, if they are vacant because the rules have not incentivized anybody to act, that's what we're trying to do here. We wanna make sure we're creating opportunities and trying to get them right to be able to allow for the creation of housing. As for existing buildings, which may have vacancies, frequently that relates to policies that are well beyond uh, zoning, market forces, interest rate environments, tax incentive issues, state regulations, et cetera. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of issues at play there, but in zoning, we do wanna create opportunities to fill vacant land uh, where there are great opportunities for the creation of all types of housing. Hi, thank you. My name is Patrick Hall. I'm an owner of a local small business, Elan Flowers, uh, serving downtown Manhattan since 1983, uh, surviving here in this community. I want to first thank the New York Law School because they have helped us with our local um, Tribeca Alliance partnership, with getting certified here in our neighborhood to create a merchants association. But as a small business owner, I want to ask, what are any of the incentives that are being considered for small businesses? in neighborhoods to uh, do the carbon neutrality thing. For example, I want to own a electric vehicle and charge it and use local deliveries with an electric vehicle. Yeah, so uh, the short answer is that uh, we have lots of incentives that are present through federal, state, and even some city sources uh, to encourage and enable the sorts of changes that you are suggesting. This proposal is designed to get zoning out of the way when people actually want to implement them. 
So I do want to make that distinction because zoning uh, can provide land use incentives for growth, land use incentives for the creation of affordable density bonuses here, uh, limitation of obstacles there. It does not provide the specific financial incentives uh, to do anything. Uh, that's not what zoning has the power to do. We want to get our obstacles out of the way so that when you want to make those choices on whether it's electric vehicle charging or whether it's uh, growing, you know, something on the roof or whether it is um, uh, solar panels or whatever, that we are not in the way of that process. Thank you very much to the New York Law School, uh, Commissioner. Um, Director Gorodnik, my name is Ken Brown. I'm the district manager of Bronx Community Board 5. So thank you. Um, when you mentioned the decoupling of parking to uh, housing development, that uh, it be, gave me pause. Um, in my six years as a district manager, I've never, to my recollection, had a developer come in and say, we're going to put any parking in. And to hear that there's going to be a lifting of any requirement for parking is troubling. Our community is inundated by out-of-state out par um, uh, registration. We have double parking that is ubiquitous. And what I'm, my question is, what kind of coordination is there, particularly with the Department of Transportation? Because it seems to me that they come to us frequently and impose programs that reduce parking. They put in bus lanes, they put in bike lanes, city bike, everything. The demand for curb space is tremendous. And to hear that there's now going to be a lifting of restrictions or correspondence between affordable, between housing development and parking, to me what that equates to is our community is going to get really damaged. So what kind of comprehensive planning is there? Around? Great, thank you for the question. Uh, I really appreciate it. And also I will note again that we are, we're not putting parking maximums in place and that's a deliberate act. We know that it is important in some neighborhoods, perhaps Bronx Community Board 5 is one of those. And by the way, forgive me for noting Community Board 5 generically, uh, there are community board fives in all boroughs. And so actually except for Staten Island, there's only three. But anyway, but that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, so our goal here is to enable the level of flexibility of conversation when a, an, a new project comes to you and comes to the city planning department uh, for us to think about what is the right level of parking in that development. Uh, it might be higher than, uh, in some cases, it might be significantly higher than what the minimum requirements otherwise would have said, and that is okay. But our point here is the definition as if we know the answer of what that defined minimum is, is, uh, is not working in a lot of cases. I mean, even your, your question is an interesting one where people are coming to you and they're saying, well, we don't, we don't want putting, to put parking here today, even with the minimum requirements. Sometimes people are seeking waivers, sometimes they get them, sometimes they don't get them. Uh, but to us, you know, having the thoughtful conversation up front as to what is the right amount of parking here in this neighborhood, in this development is the conversation we should be having. But the, the blanket prescriptions are the things which are getting in the way and are creating real challenges for housing creation. And so we don't want parking to automatically be that conflict. We know in a lot of neighborhoods, and we hear from the Bronx, and we hear from other neighborhoods too, that they want to see more parking, and that is okay. And this does not impede that from happening. We just want to eliminate that conflict that exists up front. Uh, yes, my name's uh, Anthony Hom. Um, a question uh, with the recent uh, flooding, um, the, uh, your, your, uh, your department's policy uh, with respect to basement um, apartments and the uh, development of and, and allowing for them uh, talking about cellar apartments uh, throughout the boroughs. Yes. Um, obviously, there's, uh, there are a lot of people who live in basement apartments in New York City today, and there are a lot of people who live unsafely in basement apartments in New York City today. Um, and we, uh, we want what this proposal is designed to do 
is to be able to enable amount, a, a, an amount of additional legal corresponding space on a small density, as low density uh, homeowner property. We can't legalize in zoning all, all of the challenges that exist for basic, basement apartments. We can limit some of the uh, zoning impediments to get you to a place where a basement apartment could be one day made safe and, and legal. Uh, we support efforts at the state of New York to find ways to uh, safely legalize as many apartments as possibly can be safely legalized. But I will note that one thing we do not do in this proposal, and it is deliberate, is to enable accessory units in flood prone areas, places which are in special coastal risk districts. We have specific requirements in areas uh, which we know are problem areas as it relates to flooding. Um, most of the city is, is not in those areas. So we actually believe we're creating a meaningful opportunity here, but we are sensitive to that concern. The questions about life and safety uh, uh, changes to be able to enable basement apartments to be brought up to code. Those are primarily state law questions, but we look forward to having those conversations with our colleagues in Albany. Good morning, my name is Raji Riyat Munglam. Thank you, Commissioner Garabnik. I work in a public defender setting and in community mental health. I'm curious, um, I'd like to, um, know a bit more about the supportive housing, um, how that would increase through this plan and specifically for justice involved persons. Um, there's lots of, as you know, there's lots of restrictions um, at this time. So are there data on what the plans are for supportive housing for justice involved persons? Yes. So, um, Well, we'll, well, go ahead. Yeah, people um, who are involved um, either formally or presently in the criminal legal system, perhaps they're coming out of jails or prisons and are in need of reentry. Um, and in the first step of reentry is having some kind of safe, stable housing. So, so most importantly here, I'll tell you what we are trying to do to enable the creation of more supportive housing. And as it relates to justice involved individuals, uh, the questions are broader than zoning questions. The enabling of supportive housing as a thing is what we do and can do in zoning. So the first thing we're doing in zoning is we're applying that universal affordability preference, that bonus for senior affordable to all types of affordable, that would include supportive. We are also allowing for the conversion of an office building to residential and also would include supportive housing. So we are trying to significantly increase the opportunities for supportive housing uh, as, a, uh, as, as an answer here in many cases. Uh, and this proposal will, uh, will, will free up individual owners and, building, um, and buildings to be able to do just that. Let me say, we're gonna keep going for the four people who are still standing up to ask questions. Um, good morning, Commissioner. I want to thank you for this amazing effort your department has put into this proposal. It's stunning, and I never would have predicted it, having been involved in planning and real estate since the 70s. However, I most respectfully like to disagree with your comment that the removal of restrictions against dancing in Use Group 6 is the last vestige of of uh, restrictions against dancing in the city. The primary regulator of dancing in the city and live music is the New York State Liquor Authority with the cooperation of the community boards. And for example, community boards require licensed applicants to sign stipulations prohibiting dancing and live music. There are 2,400 liquor licenses in New York City that prohibit dancing. Right now, this proposal will do nothing. Some of those are in use group six, but I think many are in use group 12 and seven. What's the data on this? Both your department and the um, nightlife office have declined to do the data. Uh, Amazingly, even though there's no prohibition against live music in the zoning law, there are 5,000 liquor licenses that specifically prohibit live music. So 
I just would disagree with your comment. Good. Let me let me ask you one okay. one quick follow. Thank you. So just if I understand your position, you do not like those restrictions at the state liquor authority that are imposed, or you do you you do think that they're helpful tools? Just so I understand. Well, I don't think they're helpful tools the way okay. they are done. Okay. And it's and I wouldn't say it's just the liquor authority. It's really the community boards because the SLA tends to defer to the community Fair enough. board. Fair enough. So I guess, you know, you, I, I'll take your, your note because when I say last vestiges, I was referring to the zoning last vestiges. And so I take your point. You are correct to say that there are other limitations that are put into place. They are outside of zoning. And I think you make, I think you make a good point. We want the zoning rules to be clear. And that's what this is after. But they are not outside the city of yes. And the community boards are part of the city of yes, and they should not be allowed to require stipulations of no dancing and no live music. Thank you. Thank you. That was an interesting point. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, very gone. Let's go on the next side. Thank you, Commissioner, for a thoughtful presentation. Um, with the imminent implementation of congestion pricing, transit hubs outside of the Midtown area will shortly be experiencing a, a bit of a parking crisis. Um, at the same time, uh, your proposal suggests that uh, it is eliminating the parking uh, requirements for new construction, especially in areas near uh, transit hubs. Uh, have, has anybody given any consideration to the possibility of residential parking permits for those areas that will be especially impacted by this double whammy? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great question um, and one that um, is not again, I, you know, it's an easy one for me to say it happens to be true. It is not something that we we can do in zoning. We are looking right now as part of the uh, environmental review of this proposal, which is just starting. What are the potential impacts? What are the things that would need to be mitigated? What are the things that we're proposing here that uh, create challenges or might require additional city investment or policy change. So I think that this will be a live question. Listen, you have congestion pricing as its own as its own uh, uh, um, proposal that is moving forward, um, and then you have and you have this recognizing that um, you know when you're talking about areas near transit and the need for parking, uh, you know that again that is uh, that is okay. And we're not actually saying that there is a barrier to creating parking where it is needed. Um, and we in zoning are trying to find that sweet spot of saying, well, boy, if we, uh, if we are limiting housing creation with a parking mandate that somebody doesn't want, and frankly, a neighborhood in, some, in many cases, they, maybe not Bronx Five, but like in other neighborhoods, you know, there are other neighborhoods, they say, please don't, no more, don't give us another parking space. Like, please do not give do not require another parking space. So we, we want to have that level of finesse to create that, that flexibility. Uh, but to your point about residential parking permits, uh, that would be a parallel conversation, not one here in zoning. And we're going to be looking at what the impacts are here and doing uh, what we need to do to address this. On this side. Hi, uh, thank you to the law, New York Law School. Thank you, uh, Ross Sendler and Director Grodnick. Uh, my name is Leila Logiziko. I'm the chair of the Land Use, Housing and Zoning Committee of Manhattan Community Board 5. Um, Dan, <laughs> um, Dan uh, thank you for this really great presentation. We are very excited to actually work with you, especially on Midtown South rezoning. This is something that is really very, very, uh, you know, major for our district and uh, really very exciting. I have um, two questions, if I can. One of them has to do with the 20% bonus. As it applies to CB5, Manhattan CB5, we are already the densest district in the city. We have no contextual zoning. We are at 10 FAR through and through uh, that is bumped to 12 with, uh, you know, affordable ho housing. Um, should we expect in the language of the uh, city of yes or the rezoning for the uh, 12 FAR cap to be lifted? Uh, that would be a great outcome if it were. We can't count on it because that requires state action, of course. Um, the reason I believe it would be a great outcome is because, and for the benefit of those who are less familiar with uh, what Layla is referring to, today under New York state law, 
New York City is capped on density for residential at 12. So it's just a, the density calculation. Can't go above 12. If you want to go above 12, can't go above 12. Community Board 5, Manhattan, Bronx, or otherwise wants you to go above 12, you can't go above 12. And we know that not everybody wants to go above 12. It's okay. But we don't even have the right to do that in New York City today. So in when we think about planning for New York, when we think about densely populated areas, we think that we all, by the way, we have commercial office buildings that are a 30 FAR, 20 FAR. You know, this is not something that we inherently fear in New York City, high density buildings. We think we should have the flexibility. But to your point and to your question, you know, we are, we are beginning our study of Manhattan South, Midtown South. Um, we're thinking about the land use rules and regs. Um, and if the state were to lift the 12 FAR cap, nothing happens anyway. Uh, so we would then have to think about where, if anywhere, we would take a step to allow for a more than 12 FAR building. So nothing becomes automatic, nothing gets built into this plan. And perhaps, you know, if they, if they lift the cap midstream and we are in the middle of our conversation, uh, about Midtown South, well, we, we could certainly talk about that, but uh, nothing happens automatically as a result of state action. So is that to say that the 20% bonus would be offsite if it's uh, hitting the FAR cap? Oh, oh, I see. I understand your question. So uh, no, you would be capped. You would be capped at, at 12. You couldn't go. You couldn't go above 12 today. Okay. Right. So and under the way the proposal is written, it's written under the current rules uh, under the state of New York. Okay, that's super helpful. I'm going to be super greedy. Can you actually touch upon casinos and how it uh, connects to the city of Yes? Is it in the economic opportunity proposal, the uh, permission for uh, casino use in New York City? It, it is not. Um, it is going to be in its own uh, standalone text amendment. Um, and so that will be coming soon. Thank you so much. Morning, Director Gorodnik. I'm Chris Slowick of Falcon Rappaport and Berkman, and I advise my clients on a variety of uh, building code and zoning issues, and I work with everybody from the biggest holding companies in the city down to single family homeowners in terms of practical implementation of things to address uh, problems with their buildings. On the uh, carbon neutrality aspect of City of Yes, I've been asked twice this week by people who saw uh, the publicity on the carbon neutrality, and my clients are also very interested in Local Law 97, the clients, obviously. Um, carbon neutrality, quite obviously, from a policy standpoint, is going the same way as the Local Law 97 mandates, and I just wanted to uh, learn very quickly is to what extent was there a linkage between the carbon neutrality uh, changes to the zoning resolution and the carbon reduction goals in local law 97, and what's the best way to learn about how those might work together? Thank you. Uh, in short, when you have significant goals and rules that require decarbonization uh, and make, uh, will push for real changes in buildings around the city, um, and at the same time, you have rules that are in place that impede your ability to do those very things that you want people to do, you gotta address that. And so that proposal, our City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality proposal, is designed to enable the sorts of changes that people want to make and that we want, and in many cases will be requiring people to make, uh, to be able to comply with Local Law 97. So from the perspective of this proposal, it is, find ways to get the zoning obstacles out of the way to allow for better compliance with local law 97. Uh, and more generally, even if you put aside local law 97, people do wanna make good decisions for them, their families, for the health of their neighborhoods and city, and we are in the way. So that is what this is designed to address. Last question. Good morning, all. Uh, Joseph Bazor here. Thank you for your time and your patience as well. I'm inquisitive in reference to, as I'm in favor of your proposal, uh, what is to offset this cost? As you mentioned, incentives, yet who's ultimately gonna be to pay for it? And what, where is this cost gonna fall upon? In reference
reference to the homeowners, the tenants, the small business owners, and, and how will these incentives offset the cost in order to do so? Thank you. Is that is that question related to the carbon neutrality proposal or, or housing or any of them? And, well, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is the same for all of them, which is in zoning, we set the policies to enable action to happen. Uh, and if you're successful, and if you define the rules properly and you hit the right mark, somebody wants to do something and they wanna do it in a way that is consistent with the way you have set the rules uh, to govern neighborhoods, the whole city, et cetera. So uh, our mark of success will be if there is that sweet spot of opportunity for people to actually act as it relates to something like uh, the environmental initiatives, you know, we enable the thing, but for some people, it's going to be complicated, expensive, uh, challenging, implausible, et cetera. That's why we look to all the other opportunities that exist out there, subsidy programs, federal, state, Con Edison. We look at the New York City Accelerator, which uh, has been advanced recently to help people who are looking to make a lot of these changes, but don't quite know where to turn and may not even have the resources to be able to implement them. Uh, so, you know, we in zoning enable the thing and then we require and lean on the other policies out there to do it. Uh, same thing is true for the housing creation too, by the way, I will note like New York City, we are not building the things that I described in this proposal. We are enabling the things that I described in this proposal. And if the environment is right, if the incentives are right, the interest rate environment is right, maybe, and then just maybe somebody will take a chance and build something. We hope they will. We hope that we are creating the right incentives here to allow for responsible growth around the city. Uh, but people make their, their individual determinations on what to do, how to act, and when. We just wanna make sure that zoning is consistent with our values and our goals. Terrific. Well, thank you. This has been, thank you to the questions. I hope the questions were terrific. And thank you all for coming. I also want to thank our founding sponsors, Con Edison, Verizon, and the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. Uh, so this brings the conclusion of this a really extraordinary breakfast. Thank you for staying with extra 20 minutes to 25 minutes to answer the questions. I'm glad that you did. I want to, um, uh, yeah, pe people come and, the, and they want to ask questions and I'm glad they had the opportunity and thank you for good responses to them. Uh, as we like to do, we like to give a, pro a product of the scholarship of this law school and to my colleague, Molly Manning has just published a book called The War of Words. Uh, it was a terrifically exciting review of this in the Wall Street Journal this Monday. You're going to love this book and I'll give it to you with thanks for coming on this wonderful day. Thank and you thank you all on a rainy morning. Thank you all for showing up. We'll be back for another breakfast.